Yeah, but we're going to not be here. We're going to leave here at one. Yeah, Oh, that's preliminary. And where's that? That's the farm park. Yeah. Where is it being held? So, uh, there's an amphitheater that we can sit down outside. Also, Riverdale is having one of the tours. But I think they're all very good. <coughs> Yes, sir. Great. He's nice. Guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Quite a guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, with, uh, with, um, That's a different. Of course, we all make different voices. Mm -hmm. But his is distinctly mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. I like the way. Testing. Testing. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming out to the uh, candidate forum for the Board of Commissioners District, District 1. So happy for you all to be here. Please, next slide. So just an overview today, we'll do a welcome, short welcome, which we're doing right now. We'll get into the candidate forum, and then we'll have some announcements and some meet and greet opportunity with the candidates. Next slide, please. So this event is a collaboration between three community organizations, Organized Clayton, Villages of Ellenwood Coalition, and the Sunrise Movement. And we decided to come together to bring this information to the community. And um, 
the reason why we're doing the special election is because of the passing of Commissioner Singleton. And I would like to take a moment of silence as well as to acknowledge um, the 9-11 victims as today is the 20th anniversary. So take a moment of silence for both um, Commissioner Sonia Singleton as well as the 9-11 victims. Thank you. And with that being said, I would like to introduce um, Elder Denise Baker for to start us out with a prayer. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Let us all pray. Gracious Almighty God and King, we do give you glory and honor. We bless your name. Father, we thank you for waking us this morning, oh God, and giving us minds, Father, to want to bless you, to want to acknowledge you in all our ways. Father, we are here today, and we're asking, Lord God, your blessing, oh God, upon these candidates, Father, that you will move in their lives, Lord God, and that you will strengthen and empower them. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you will give them what is needed and necessary for your people, Father. We bless you, Lord God. We ask that you will touch and that you will move in this place on today. Father, you know everything that is needed for the community. You know the things that people need. You, you see the desires, oh God, of our hearts. And we just thank you right now because you are great and an awesome God. Father, we are asking your blessing upon the Singletary family. Lord God, that you will bless them, oh God, in the loss of their loved one. Father, that you will move for them, Father. We thank you, Lord God, that you will shorten their grief period, Father, and that you will just let them remember the good things, the memories, the good memories. Father, we ask, oh God, that you will bless those, Father, that were in the 9-11 attacks, Father. We thank you that you will bless those families. Oh God, that you will watch over them and that you will keep them. Father, let your spirit just reign in this place. Yeah. Father, on today. And Father, we hope and we pray, Father, that you would allow, Lord God, the person, person that will stand in the forefront, the one that will lead your people, Lord God, to where they need to be. Father, that you will just bless that person. Father, we thank you because we know, Father, that everyone can't win. Well, but we are all winners yes, in our own yes. way. And we thank you, Lord God, right now for your goodness. Father, that you will move. Father, that you will just show up and show out, Lord God, for your people. We ask it in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Can you please advance to the next two slides? And next slide. And now I'll introduce uh, Miss Sonia to introduce our, our moderator. Good morning. Good morning. We're so happy that you're here. And today, our moderator is Terrica Scott. Terrica Scott, who is one of our collaborators today, and she's with the Villages of Elmwood Coalition. With further, without further ado, we have now Terrica. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here, and thank you for that brief and great introduction. Um, I will tell you a little bit about my background um, before I get started and first say first, I'm just humbled to be here today. Um, my day job is with the CDC. Um, I lead communication programs there. I've been there since for 14 years. Um, I moved to District 1 in 2019. Um, so I'm new to District 1, but I've been in the Atlanta area for um, since 2006. So um, I, I really also want you to know that um, I have been in the community really long time working, and it's great to be in Clayton County working. Um, and so, without further ado, thank you for uh, being here today. We have an outstanding um, uh, 
I guess, table or dais of wonderful leaders who have come out to lead or try to lead. And so I hope that today we can all come together and really give them um, what, who we are as District 1. Okay, we're going to have people in the audience that are going to help us with questions today. Um, we have some prepared, but if you have a question that you would like to ask, you have given, you should have a note card, okay? Um, put your question on the note card. Um, and Mari um, Gusto, who's in the gray shirt, and Brenda Harrison, who's in the green shirt there, will be able to collect those, and I'll do a call for those, okay? All right, I think we're almost ready to go. Yeah. Yes. A post it note. You got a post it note. You got a post. Okay, you got it. All right. One more, any more questions before we begin? A card, please. He needs a post it. Okay, get it. The way we're going to do the, the form today is I'm going to ask each candidate a question. Um, you're going to have two minutes to answer your question. Um, and after you answer your question, you're going to be looking at Atona. Um, she's going to be um, doing your, your timekeeper, okay? So she'll let you know when you have 30 seconds to go, as fast as you wrap it up so the next person can, can speak, okay? Um, just to kick us off, each of you are going to be able to do a one-minute opening. Um, and to wrap us up, you're going to also be able to do a one-minute closing statement, okay? Are we ready to get going? All right, first question. The first, the opening. <laughs> I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, aren't I? We're going to start in alphabetical order today. Um, and so we're going to start with um, Shigel Creek Thurman, who is the first one today. So she has her one minute opening statement. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all again for taking the time to come out today. I am Shigel Creek Thurman. Um, three names, third on the ballot is what I'm telling everyone. Um, I am a 23-year resident of Clayton County. I've been, <clears throat> excuse me please, in District 1 for a majority of that time, so I have a vested interest here in seeing Clayton County do well. I'm a paralegal by trade. I've been a paralegal for about 25 years, and I worked most recently in the past six years for the Sheriff's Department in Clayton County, and now I work for the DeKalb County Sheriff's Office. Um, my trade and um, training as a paralegal brings me to the table with a particular skill set that I believe um, differentiates me and will help me to be an excellent commissioner and hit the ground from day one. So thank you again for coming out today. I look forward to speaking with each of you. Great, thank you. Our next would be... Um, <coughs> Ms. Deloach. <laughs> Regina Deloach. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What about now? <laughs> All right, let's wake up. Good morning, Clayton County. And also, good morning to each of the organizations that have hosted this event this morning. Again, I am Regina Deloach, and I do look forward to serving you as your next District 1 Commissioner. Many of you have asked, why are you running? That is the most basic but most important question you can ask any candidate or any person seeking office. Simply put, I have dedicated my personal and professional life to serving our community and to improving our county, which is Clayton County. Next, I have de dedicated my personal and professional life again, but however, my training and making and economic development has allowed me to continue to grow our county. It is my goal during this forum is to earn your vote, and it is my mission once I am elected to ensure that good government works for all and not just a few. Again, I am Regina Deloach, and I do look forward to serving you as your next District 1 Commissioner. Great, thank you. Hawking DeVoe. Hi, my name is Hackwin DeVoe, and I ask you to vote simply DeVoe. D for development, E for education, P for voters' rights, O for opportunity, and E for equality. I run not only for my family, but the families next to me, the families up the street from me, the families in the communities around me, because we're all connected. Clayton County matters. I bring to the experience and the table my military experience, 
my experience with the Cab County government in which I work, work with local government administration for over 21 years. And I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And what I've learned from all of that is always put people above politics because you are our bosses. And I remember that and I honor that. And I will appreciate your opportunity to serve you as a servant leader for this county because Clayton County matters. Thank you. Thank you. We have Junior Jackson. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Junior Good morning. JJ Jackson. Well, again, I am Junior Jackson. I've been in Clayton County now for well over 27 years. Well, no, excuse me. I'm not even that old. Excuse me. Maybe 21 years. Big part. But again, I'm running because, as you can see, I'm committed to people. I'm committed to seeing my community grow, thrive, and flourish. Uh, my mom moved here in 1999 from Patterson, New Jersey, which was just uh, affected by Ida, and I was actually up there the day after it struck. So what I'm saying is my, I moved here to Clayton County and I came to my youth and to myself here. My family's here, I have a very young family. I've even taught in District 1 at Morrow High School. I've also taught at uh, Lagonia High School. So my commitment to people have, it hasn't just begun. It's since I was a, a, a young person, a young high school senior and junior, committing myself to volunteering, feeding the homeless, and making sure that people can afford where they live, enjoy a better quality of life. And so I ask you, on September 21st to vote for Junior Jackson because he's working for you. He wants to represent you. He wants you to be at the table. Thank you. Elena Reeves. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to first thank uh, all of the community organizers who put on today's event and everyone who's tuning in live. My name is Elena Reeves, and Clayton County raised me from first grade to my first job to now my first home in Morrow. Clayton County has shaped me into the woman and the leader that I am today. I'm running for County Commission District 1 because I want to help shape what Clayton County looks like for the next generation of leaders. I have been on the ground listening to the voters of District 1, calling them, knocking on their doors personally, and I hear and share your concerns about adding more sidewalks, making sure that the roads are safe, making sure that we have more sit-down restaurants, making sure that we have healthier food options. I am running for county commissioner because I am a community organizer and I want to serve the community of District 1. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with that, those are some really important words, of messages in those opening statements. Um, let's jump right into the questions. Um, again, if you do have a question, go ahead and write that on your post-it sticker. We'll be collecting those um, shortly. Um, I'm going to ask each question um, in alphabetical order, and I'm going to start with um, Shigel Creek Thurman, who will be our first um, candidate to ask um, to get the first question. Um, and the question is, what is your plan of action for the first 100 days? Realistically, what do you think you can accomplish? That is a phenomenal question. Um, one that I have answered on my website and in writing, but I'll share a little bit with you today. Um, my first, based on what I am hearing from the residents and the priorities that match mine, the first thing that we have to do is look at the existing zoning that's on the books. A good portion of our district is surrounded by development that is industrial and it's starting to take them over, over in Ellenwood. We need to see what's on the books, what zonings need, are open and are at a point where they can be changed immediately. The next thing that we need to address is streetscape, what we're looking at, beautification. The county as a whole does not look that great. We need to find out who is accountable for actually getting the streets clean, landscaping, because your tax dollars are paying for it. How about that? And we know that there is a lot of money that is coming out in property taxes. My third priority on a top priority is to work to address the property taxes, to work to lower those, to see where we are in amortization, to see where our collections are, um, to make sure that the revenue that should be coming into the county is coming into the county so that it can be applied in the appropriate places. I'm the only candidate that has a plan to lower property taxes, so I will immediately begin working with the state delegation 
to find ways to maybe raise the homestead exemption and actually lower property values. But to me, the thing we must first address before we can do any development or anything is making sure that our county reflects the people who live here. Thank you. Thank you. This question is for Regina Deloach. Regina, as Shigel alluded to in her response, the north section of District 1 is heavily zoned as heavy industrial. Knowing that the board is reviewing current proposals for warehouses in this area, what are you going to do to handle the zoning concern? And what do you plan, and how do you plan to handle the current warehouses that are being proposed in this area? Thank you so much. Again, if we go back into the history of Clayton County, Clayton County was zoned HI, which is high industrial, all back to 19, I want to say 95. So as we came forward uh, with our county, we changed it over in the 2000s to mixed use development. And then we did another change with PUD, and we decided to mix it with residential. In 2018, I shared with the community that it is not good at the time to mix HI with residential. And we, we, we continue to do so, but however, if we look at where we are in the world of e-commerce, and it's not warehousing, when you see Amazon and the various um, different delivery coming into our community, that is creating jobs. With the expansion of the Port of Savannah, that is additional uh, jobs coming into our community. So with the, expand the expansion of the port, you're bringing additional logistics into our community, that is creating jobs. When I say logistics, we have to remember that within logistics, you still have finance directors, uh, graphics de uh, designers, you have a plethora of different uh, careers located within logistics. And when we're looking at e-commerce, when those businesses come in, we have to dictate the businesses and the, we have to dictate what we want as a community to come in. But at, currently at this time, we have to grow in logistics because logistics and e-commerce is the way from Cobb County to South Fulton to Douglas. That is the way it is going. So that allows our community to employ people from our community in high paying jobs. Thank you. Again, I want to remind you if you just arrived, if you have a question, we would love to have it. Um, please put it on your note card and give it to either Brenda Harrison or Maury Gustel. Our next question is for Hacklin DeVoe. Um, when obstacles arise and disagreements occur within the Board of Commissioners, what plan of action are you going to take to make sure that District 1 thrives through roadblocks and disagreements? So my chief thought is keeping focus who we work for, and that is the people, the constituents of Clayton County. We have to remember that they are our bosses and they're wants and desires for this county is a shared desire and we all should be focused on that that's job number one if we keep that in view i believe through communications that we can work with one another we all share that common goal to see clayton county thrive and so when disagreement comes we can all be agreeable in our disagreement but we got to be unified in the vision that we have for this county so my thing is if there's disagreement is to be mindful to the commissioner that, hey, we're servant leaders and we have a constituent to answer to. Let's keep their priorities first. Let's put aside any partisan bickering or any cliques that we may see that have developed within the organization or the board and keep it first and foremost, the citizens, because they are our bosses. So, and I always lead with his thoughts. Again, he or she who masters their passions are mightier than he that takes a city. In other words, we've got to be focused on the greater goal, not what we feel personally and not take things personally. we got to remember it's a unified front and a unified effort. So sometimes we have to take a back seat to our own personal desire if it's meaning the greater good for the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Question for you. What are your plans to improve senior living in the district? Specifically, we have a senior living complex that's being built right now on Grant Road in District 1. Using this as an example, what are your plans for the next 12 months after elected to make sure that this area is accessible, safe, and provides a place for them to thrive physically? emotionally, and socially? Thank you for the question. First and foremost, as the development is going, we want to make sure that they have access to all of the public transportation and the need that they're going to need as it relates to if they're able to drive themselves. We want to make sure that with those developments that they have access to all the resources that are available to them. We want to make sure that with that development that they also have access to, if anything, there's a building super, a super who can help them to also get access and uh, obtain information about some of the various access that they might need, rides to the grocery store, uh, rides to pick up the medication, rides to doctor's appointments. But essentially, we want to make sure, we want to make sure that they're safe, we want to make sure that they're comfortable, we want to make sure that they actually have the opportunity to get out, walk, and feel comfortable, and have clean sidewalks, clean streets, clean, uh, you know, uh, nicely maintained property from uh, across the street, you know, as it relates to uh, over, overgrown grass. So my number one focus as it relates to senior living, they're building new ones, but I want to see people or developers, instead of putting forward applications for new development, let's try to use adaptive reuse spaces, spaces that are vacant and were used for something else, and now we can transform it and bring it up to a more contemporary use. I think even now with the developments, we need to stop building and start to see how we can utilize the spaces that are vacant and not being utilized. And again, that could be used for senior living, that could be used for affordable housing, for uh, you know, first time home buyers, and even student living. So again, I definitely wanna make sure that senior, senior citizens, <coughs> with this new development being built, they have a place where they can get their recreation, get their exercise, get their walking, but then they also have access to MARTA and all the, the various other transportation options for people who don't drive and who are getting up in age. And I also want them to have a beautiful scenery as they are going out to go to their doctor's appointments and just going out to get their daily exercise. Thank you for the question. Thank you. All right, our next question is for Elena Reeves. Ms. Reeves, as a new District 1 commissioner, what is your strategy to engage the community and keep us informed about events that impact us? How will you ensure that you are accessible and you're responsive to your constituents' needs? I first want to say that I love that question. Uh, as I've said before, I am a community organizer. I have spent years uh, in Clayton County as president of the uh, as president of the Clayton County Young Democrats, making sure that young Democrats and young leaders across the county were engaged and empowered in the government process. I fully commit to doing that as a District 1 Commissioner. I talk to many people at their doors and on their phones, and that's something that I will continue to do. As far as outreach, I know there is some frustration from folks who, who say that they haven't heard about all the events that are happening and that they haven't heard about, uh, they, they wanna be more informed. And so I love the fact that people are saying we want that information, we wanna know what's going on in the planning and zoning meetings, we wanna know what's going on with our local government. So we need to make sure that we are utilizing every way to access each of the residents. Maybe that's the through a texting program and making sure that we're keeping constant communication with folks uh, and meeting people where, where they are, having community forums throughout the year. And just as our, our commissioner, uh, Sonia, uh, Greg, Sonia Singleton Gregory did, having once a month meetings just with updates on what's going on with the district, having district-wide community newsletters and making sure that people are informed. But uh, again, I, I pledge to be accessible. I've been accessible even before uh, I, I decided that I wanted to be a candidate in, in this race and I pledge to continue doing so. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna start again um, with Shigel for the next question. Um, we're gonna come back around to each individual again with a new question. Um, Shigel, what are your plans to address the blighted areas in our district? Thank you for the question, and I think it's a great one. We have um, 
almost half of the building and development in Clayton County is over 30 to 50 years old. Um, we have buildings, spaces um, that are blithe and are running down quickly. We have shopping centers, what used to be grocery stores, that there's absolutely no utilization whatsoever. One of the things and the challenges that I feel has happened with the existing, for whatever the reasons are, we develop in Clayton County, but there is no comprehensive approach. So I've been on a lot of streets. You'll see a development back here, but you're going down the street. It's winding. There's no street lights, no sidewalks. And so it's like an ad hoc, sort of like Terra Boulevard. If you look down Terra Boulevard, it's just a bunch of different stuff going on, right? So for me, I believe that a more comprehensive approach that will address neighborhoods and things of that nature when we are redeveloping into spaces that work well together. We can develop, but it must be spaces, whether it be mixed use space, something for young professionals, whether it be more senior living services, or whether it be a new home development or businesses, it must be comprehensive and aesthetically pleasing to the eye. So I would jump on immediately a plan that takes that all into consideration. We can get approached with a lot of different things, but just because we get approached with it doesn't mean it's a good fit for District 1. So my job is to bring home and develop an aesthetic that is forward thinking, right? that is new, that is sustainable, but is beautiful, and it also is functional and works for the community that it's in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Regina Deloach, our next question. How can we promote a better quality of life and attract more families to the county and the district? And how can we continue to build places for people to live that are affordable? Thank you so much. Currently in District 1, we talked about two things earlier. We're building senior housing and senior living over in Grant Road, but also because we have a high transit rate within our school system, we're building affordable housing over in District 1 off of Mount Zion. It's called the Mount Zion Platte. There's a 300 unit um, affordable housing that will come to that area, as well as a part of that 300 unit we have placed in there a uh, senior living that will encompass 94. So as we build on our community and look around our community, we have to take into account the growth and from our youth all the way up to our seniors and how we build upon that and how we court in businesses. And I'm gonna jump over to, as we talk about what we have done from the development authority, we have went around and we've looked at the various businesses here. And that's the reason it was so key and important for us to develop across the Clayton State, the 26 acres mixed use development that will allow us to build two residential buildings uh, on that campus with, um, one will be a hotel and the other one would be um, condos and it will have rooftop restaurants also to ensure that we continue to court in the right businesses. There is a business incubator that will come in uh, to that particular campus that will allow us to bring in new sustainable businesses that is from our small business community so we are working and we are looking and those uh, different aspects are already in play for our county. Also on that same campus, that would allow us to bring in restaurants and eateries uh, to that area that will continue to court in and to ensure that we as a community have a live, work, play and learn environment. So that work is already being done in District 1 for our residents. Thank you. Hi, Quinn DeVoe. As you may be aware, there are several places in District 1 that are not accessible to those with disabilities. How do you plan to address this issue? And how can we promote a more inclusive community for all to thrive in District 1? <coughs> so that question is dear to me. I have a, a daughter who, due to stroke has some paralyzation on one side. So I've got to learn right up front the challenges that come with those who are disabled to whatever capacity and through whatever reasons. 
I think when we begin to develop, whether it be buildings, whether it be eateries, whether it be parks, in that plan has to be the thought of people with disabilities, even when it comes to playground. Sometimes we, when we have our use in, of all of our lands, we tend to not think of the struggles of other people and what they go through. And I think that sort of short-mindedness is not that it's duplicitous, I just think sometimes it's overlooked when it comes to development. In those scenarios, I think written into the plan has to be what are we gonna do for those with disabilities? And I think when we begin to think like that, we will not miss the effort to make it inclusive. And again, inclusive for all, for our seniors and our veterans as well. I often think about veterans going out to fight for this country and coming back to a country that's not really welcoming to them. And to me, that's disturbing. So I wanna keep all of these groups that let them know they're not on the fringes. So however we plan, however we grow, they are an integral part in how we develop and live out that plan. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question um, from the audience. And I'm gonna give that question to Junior Jackson. Junior, what are we going to do about the property managers purchasing land and not maintaining this property in the district? So, thank you for the question. I'm all for communication and trying to resolve these situations before we begin to, you know, issue citations and fines. Uh, again, as people begin, as managers begin to ignore our, you know, our warnings and our communication, you know, there needs to be you know, damages need to be consequences. But I believe that when you realize that your tenants and the people that you're essentially serving, if they're displeased with your service and how you're maintaining the property, it only makes sense for you to oblige your tenants or your constituents because essentially, if they're unhappy, then they'll leave. You know, they'll break their lease. They'll, they'll you know, and then you'll start to see things where people are paying rent, you know, late just to prove a point, not because they can't afford it, but just because they want to see their, their where they reside, their residence clean and, again, nicely maintained and manicured. But again, I, I know that through communication, effective communication and with the people behind me, with the people that you know uh, reside there, call the face of their homes, we can get those property managers to do the right thing. But as a, with the background of real estate, I recognize that when you start, start hitting people in the pockets, especially when your livelihood comes from people being able to you know, make, pay their rent, or you, you know, people, you actually getting people in those residents, because again, Sometimes it's owned by a hedge fund and they hire you as a property manager, so you're also soliciting for tenants. So again, when the owners of the hedge fund of the actual spaces begin to see that the property managers are not adequately maintaining the property and they see that the, there's more or vacant units, there's gonna be a sign there. And again, it's, it, it always starts with funds. When you hit people in the pockets, it always gets their attention. I mean, that's for corporations and that's for people just the same. So again, Fine penalty, and once you see too many vacant units, you'll see the people who actually own those, those spaces start to come after property managers, just like you see the tenants and the commissioner go after the property managers. Thank you. Thank you. Elena Reeves, question for you. District One is facing issues with illegal dumping. Knowing that the current county beautification program has been dismantled, what are your immediate actions to address this issue? And how do you think your solution will benefit the residents? That, that's a great question because when we talk about recruiting and maintaining a quality of life, we have to first talk about what does Clayton County District 1 first look like? And I mean, there are roads that you drive on like Grant Road or Forest Parkway where there is illegal dumping and we've seen it. So we need to make sure that we're utilizing code enforcement and that we are, that we are using tools uh, to make sure that we are finding individuals who are caught illegal dumping. We have to make sure that we are um, using code enforcement to uh, follow up with uh, commercial tenants um, who have uh, dumpsters behind their properties and making sure that that is not also becoming a ground 
for residents or uh, not even residents of Clayton County, but residents of other counties who are coming here. And I've, I've heard the stories from, from folks who say it's not people in Clayton County, it's individuals who are coming in from other places who are uh, dumping their trash. I think we also need to come up with a solution to make sure that every, uh, every home, every residential home in District 1 has the opportunity to have their trash collected. That has been an ongoing conversation. And I believe that if we are able to solve uh, individuals being able to um, be, being able to you know come up with a solution for how folks want to uh, take their trash out on on a weekly basis, whether that's paying per individual household or whether that's folding within to uh, the, the county resources that have trash picked up. I think that will also curtail folks who are you know putting trash bags on the top of their car, trying to drive out to go dump their trash somewhere, and it's being left on the side of the road. We need to first start with the with uh, enforcement, utilizing code enforcement, uh, putting up more signs and also uh, maybe putting up some security cameras so that we are able to uh, track those individuals who are illegally dumping and being able to find them and use those, that funding for beautification. Thank you. We're gonna combine the next question with the one we received from the audience and we're gonna give that to Shigel. Um, Shigel, what partnership opportunities would you pursue with the Board of Education? Um, and in doing so, how can we coordinate policies and decisions that will positively impact the community? Great question. Um, I think we've got to do some things twofold. So um, one of the things that I think people don't really think about, but it affects everyone in here, is that the county has a SPLOS and the school has one as well. So we're paying on both sides, both ends. You know, things are being built and developed and the citizens are just paying, paying, paying. I've had several people mention this to me and it begins to affect your pocketbook specifically when you're making those larger purchases, right? Like say you're purchasing a car and you've got a certain percent SPLOS money coming out, a certain percent school money coming out, you got school money coming out of your property taxes. So I think we need to partner just to be sure that as we move in the days ahead, that we are being as efficient as we can between the county and the school district, that our plans are, you're going to hear me say it again, comprehensive because schools don't need to go up everywhere if the quality of what's in the schools is not going up and we certainly support the school system um, but we need to be working in direct partnership and future plans quickly the other thing on the other side of the coin I'd like to see us partner to create much stronger pipeline programs for our children to have access. We can have all the jobs in the world, but if they're extremely technical, highly skilled, our kids are not getting those jobs. So I'd like to see us work to create continued partnerships. So we have what you see here. You have people who are raised here, who get educated and they build here and they get the jobs and the income to be those citizens that we need. I think that's a, a goal that we need to work toward as commissioner and school board to make sure that we see those through. Thank you. Thank you. Regina Deloach, what is your plan of action for the first 100 days? Realistically, what do you think you can accomplish? First, I'm sorry. First of all, I will continue to be, as I've always been, as accessible. Accessible to the community. Continue to hold community meetings and then create an advisory team. I feel that it is important that an advisory team comes together because no one person can do this job. As I have knocked on the doors and I have spoken with our community and our residents, I have tapped into IT, CDC, I have tapped into a plethora of people that can come in and help us, help me to move this county forward as your District 1 Commissioner. That's number one. But number two, let's sit down and talk to and talk with and meet with my colleagues of, um, I'm sorry, my commissioners. Let's talk with them because we all have a vision. Let's ensure that vision marries up to the county vision of our comprehensive plan 
of our strategic plan that we, as the development authority, I as the chair, that we have led and we have implemented. On from there, we have to continue to talk about and meet with code because no one is meeting with code enforcement. Code enforcement right now is currently situated under the Department of Corrections. It should not be under the Department of Corrections. A code should be under planning and zoning and community to develop it. So that gives me, within that time frame, I need to meet with departments, I need to talk with the department heads, I need to see what this budget is. Because right now, our budget, 53% of the budget is going toward taxes. So as the uh, chair of the development authority, I have identified, as we've given out $1.5 million in grants, some of our businesses do not have business license. So by that identification, that identified for us to bring additional revenue into our county. So meeting with department heads, meeting with my community, and creating that advisory board in 100 days, that gives me the opportunity to continue to meet the district one board. Thank you. Hi, Quinn DeVoe. As you're aware, um, the northern part of District 1 is zoned heavy industrial. Knowing that the board is currently reviewing proposals for warehouses in this northern area, how are you going to handle this zoning concern? How do you plan to handle the current warehouses that are being proposed in this area? I think chiefly we need to look at how those zones are. I think we need to put a pause so that we can actually survey what's going on and evaluate how is that going to impact the county in the future. We need more residents here, mixed residents, low income housing or affordable income housing, and even high end, because we want to bring an array of residents here. I think just me personally and the people I've talked with, we'd much rather see a subdivision go up next to us as opposed to an industrial hub for another truck stop or another warehouse. So those are some key things that I think we need to consider. We need to consider what is the greater impact. Far too often we made quick decisions to get people in, to get companies in. And we want to welcome commerce here, true indeed, but not at the expense of the residents who are already here. So we want to make sure that we make this a county where you can live, work, and play, that everybody would want to come to raise their families here. I have a group of friends who are close to me, they're like family. They hightailed it out of Clayton County, but I choose to stay and fight just like the other residents and neighbors around us. So we can make that change happen. We just need to be dogged in our stands and creative and follow the vision, not our personal vision, but the vision for all of Clayton County. People, they're our bosses. We need to hear them. So sure, all of these companies want to come here, but what does our people say? That's where our answer lies. Thank you. Great. Thank you. We're going to take a question from the audience um, that I feel is really important. So Junior, I'm going to ask you that question. How do you plan to have an economic development plan, but still set aside and preserve the green spaces and develop and maintain parks and natural areas for wildlife and for people? Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, earlier I referenced adaptive reuse spaces. Uh, initially, at previous forums, I've said that there needs to be a freeze on new development and we need to figure out how we can use the development that are here, not being used completely or fully, not to full capacity, or again, not being used at all. So again, with adaptive reuse, what they do is, let's say a place was built as a church. If that church is big That's enough, we can then rezone that church for, for it to be a, an apartment space or a multi, multi-use multi space, such as uh, uh, housing, uh, restaurants, things of that nature. So again, what I want to do, I want us to stop building. I want us to allow some of the land to just be natural and grow and allow our wildlife to continue to flourish, but then I want to use the spaces that are, already, that are already built and not being utilized currently. Again, we can take those spaces, we can turn those. You've seen in, in very major cities, Chicago, Philadelphia, again, they take old firehouses, turn them into hotels, turn them into upscale restaurants. Right now, currently, we're in need of more entertainment space. 
So by me, again, stopping the new development and building and us trying to figure out how we can reuse the spaces that are already there is going to allow our natural, our natural uh, environment, you know, the, the forest and the woods, to grow and stop cutting down trees and use the spaces that are not being utilized fully. And with that, and with that being done, we can then, again, bring the things that we need here, houses, more businesses, affordable housing, and we can allow our natural land to just grow and, and allow wildlife to continue to flourish. And so uh, I, th I thank you for the question and appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> Elena, when obstacles arise and disagreements occur within the Board of Commissioners, what plan of action are you going to take to make sure that District 1 thrives through roadblocks and disagreements? Thank you for that question. Uh, I think that it's imperative that the community residents, uh, uh, voters, and, and even those who don't uh, fully participate in, in voting in, in every election, that they have the opportunity to have their voices heard, and that when having conversations with the commission board, uh, with the, the various committees that have input on the final vote, that we remember that we are being held accountable for those who put us in office and making sure that the voices of the residents who live here in Clayton County are prioritized. And so that means that we need you all, everyone who's here, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the villages of Ellenwood, organized Clayton and the, uh, the, the Sunrise Movement, organizations that are here and concerned about the well-being and the welfare of Clayton County residents, we want to make sure uh, that, that those groups, that I mentioned I come from my background of, of organizing, you know, we need to make sure that we are growing the people power in Clayton County and making sure that those voices are heard so that when we go into county commission meetings and there is a time for a vote that we see a full room and we you know, have public comments where we're hearing back from the community. So uh, that, the answer, the answer to the question of how do you communicate with you know, the, 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 current, um, the, the current board of commissions is just continuing doing what the leaders in this room and those who are tuning in have been doing, coming and holding our elected, uh, our elected officials accountable. You, you know, if I'm fortunate enough to be elected into this position, I fully want to be held accountable. I want to continue to hear from the residents and the voters to make sure that your voices are heard and that your voices are prioritized in the votes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go back to Shigel, Treat Thurman for the next question. Shigel. What are your plans to improve senior living in the district? When we have, specifically, we have a senior living complex that's being built right now on Grand Road. Using this complex as an example, what are your plans over the next 12 months to make sure this area is accessible, safe, and provides a place for them to thrive physically, emotionally, and socially? Thank you, um, seniors. And we'll use that as a specific example. Um, that development is on Grant Road, and, and that's not the only part of District 1. Um, Ellenwood is, is a jewel. It's not the only part of <laughs> District 1, though, but we'll talk about Grant Road. So the Senior Center sits, once you go on Grant Road, it sits on the left. Um, the traffic is flying by there, right? This is a residential neighborhood and we were just talking about green spaces. And again, you have to talk about the cohesiveness. So it doesn't do any good to have a walking trail. If you go further down that street, there's a walking trail. If trucks are flying through, right, the neighborhood and your walking trail. So as it relates to the senior center right there, the first thing we have to do is move the trucks off of the residential streets in that area onto access roads and give them truck stops, right? The next thing that we need to do is to slow it down, improve it, widen it, add some streetscape so that when people come out of their house, they feel safe, right? They feel like if a senior wants to get out and walk with their friends around the neighborhood, there's lighting, there are sidewalks, the street is slower, and it's safer, right? In addition, adding to senior services, from what I have heard, they need help with transportation. 
We need to dig down and provide that for them. They need help with their prescriptions, right? They need help with that. And just using the Living Center as an example, I'll move away from it. The other seniors who live in homes need those same services and access points. And they also need to have their property tax addressed because they're on a fixed income. So we have to focus on lowering those things and giving them that specific attention. Thank you. Thank you. Regina Deloach, we got a question directly for you from the audience. And that question is, how would you prepare our children for jobs in District 1? Yes, ma'am. Yes, and thank you so much. Currently, we have partnered with the Clayton County Public Schools to create that pipeline to our, you know, to jobs here in Clayton County. So, let me back up. So we create that pipeline, so we're working in partnership with the CTAE program. There are many programs here currently in Clayton County. We have the, the nurse, well, the CNA program, um, we also have um, over at um, Monday's Mills to see, I'm sorry, the CNA program, and get all my program together, that allows our kids to go from the school into, for example, into Southern Regional. We have created those partnerships. Another partnership that we've created is Youth Behind the Business. Youth Behind the Business allows our kids to see other facets of organizations within banking, finance, Architect. Um, we also have created um, within our the development authority to allow our young people to come in from Clayton State College to see what we are doing at um, the development authority through community to development. So we are here to create that pathway with our schools to partner with our schools in order to allow our children to grow. Thank you. Hi, Quinn DeVoe, question for you. This is from the audience as well. How will you address the growing concern of rent and the, cost, the rising cost of rent in District 1? I think everyone deserves the basic human decency of a place to live, a place to grow their family. I think we should look at all programs that's available for renters one of the chief things that homeowners are concerned about when renting comes in is the quality of tenants that come to the place and also the quality of owners who are there. Specifically with my community, built into our covenant, we have a 20% of what we can rent out in the property or in the community. But our concern is what we've seen are people who move out and go elsewhere and live in other counties and they don't keep up the properties and things of that nature. And when I have a conversation with the people who are renting, well, they feel like they're being slighted by the landlord through whatever reason. So I think there needs to be a dialogue and a place that we can communicate, both with all the, uh, the renters and also the owners, because we need to understand that we can't afford to be, if you will, a county that is strictly renters and then they're neglected. Renters do pay taxes, so we need to understand what their needs are. And if we have a situation where renters can't afford a place to live, then we need to look at programs that we may have that can help them. Because the ultimate goal is to have a thriving community where we all can thrive, whether we are renting or paying mortgage. We're all one and we're all connected in Clayton County. I hate that we sometimes, not we personally, but there's a stigma, uh, a, a, a kind of a, a blight that's looked at when it comes to renters. But renters are people too, and they're raising their families just as hard as everyone else. So I think we need to stay focused on the greater goal of Clayton County, and that's work, live, and play, where we all can thrive, because we're all connected. Thank you. Thank you. Junior, how can we promote a better quality of life and attract more families to the county and continue to build places for people to live that are affordable. Like you said, housing has to be affordable. We have the various spaces. We have the spaces and it doesn't always have to be developers building new spaces. Again, and again, you're gonna, you're gonna continue to hear me say this because 
we think we can build ourselves to prosperity, and that's not going to be the case. There are places here already for people to maintain. There are hotels that are vacant. There are some apartments that are vacant. The county, and we have and we have additional funds from the CARES Act that we can use, and then through maybe a five to ten year plan, we can figure out how to continue to fund these plans outside of the CARES Act money to uh, fund these plans where we use spaces and we redevelop spaces for different usage. Uh, again. People are building here. People are coming here and applying for applications to develop certain areas because they understand that we are just an underserved community. So we have the workforce and we have the people here and they know that the money is here. Whether it's through public assistance or whether it's through retirement, people's pension, they know that there is cash in this county and that's why you see people continue to put forth applications. Again, we want people to not only rent, we want people to, if you start renting, we want to create a program where the landlord can essentially maybe if they've been there for five or 10 years or even longer, some people have been renting for 20 years, where that where those families or that person can move from renting to possibly moving into ownership, whether it be through owner finance, whether it be through a small, uh, small relationship with a credit union or a smaller local branch bank. So again, I think with adaptive reuse, we can use some of the spaces that are vacant, we can turn those into uh, affordable housing, and then with those people who have been renting for so long, we want to get them away from renting and get them into actual home ownership. I think there's nothing more relieving and, and, and pleasurable, you know, than owning a home to say that I've made it to the point where, again, this is my space. Nobody can take it from me unless I don't pay my taxes or my mortgage, but otherwise, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. So thank you for the question. Thank you. I'm going to combine the next question with one we received with the audience um, and, and give that to Elena. Um, what are your plans to address the blighted areas in the district and how would you define sustainable development? When I think about sustainability and I think about uh, what the next 10 to 20 years is going to look like in, in Clayton County, we need to make sure that we are utilizing renewable resources. We need to make sure, just as we had a question on how do you incorporate, how do you incorporate more green space into the area, we know that climate change is real and that it is affecting us and we know that in Clayton County we bear the environmental brunt of not only the airport but with the influx of uh, the, the, the uh, of trucking companies and, and warehouses we also bear that environmental brunt of air quality and air pollution so when we think about sustainability we have to put we have to put all of those factors into effect i know there's a local newspaper here in clayton county that tracks the air quality so when we're looking at what type of buildings we're building we need to make sure that we are utilize we, we are um recruiting businesses that will practice leed standards for sustainable, environmentally friendly buildings. We need to make sure that we are incorporating that green space that we talked about. In South Clayton, we have, uh, in, in, South, in the panhandle of Clayton County, there's a wetlands, uh, you know, a, a, a statewide renowned wetlands. We have green space here in District 1. Clayton State University is 214 acres with seven lakes. Uh, you know, I, I, I live down the street from Clayton State, so I bike throughout the community. Let's incorporate more walking trails. Let's, you know, make sure that there is accessibility throughout the community. That includes building more sidewalks. When we talk about accessibility and sustainability, it's also about improving quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. We've got some great questions from the audience. Keep them coming. Um, I'm gonna give Shaquille the first question that we got from the audience that um, has just come. And she said she would like to know how will you move the county and the school district out of tier one and title one status? Great question. So tier one and title one status is a combination of three things. It's a combination of your census data, your um, jobs and salaries, and those things are combined to give you what is called a, a tier rating. Those are given out by the Georgia Public Service Commission, okay? So what comes with your tier rating, the lower your tier, that means the higher your joblessness rate, the lower the skill set. So tier, Clayton County is a tier one, which is the lowest. So when she says moving us out of tier one, that means that we would be moving up in tier. So what that would mean for us 
is beginning to work with our existing citizens to help to do two things, help them obtain skills and also help them to obtain jobs, okay? So the tier one status, it, the, the way Georgia has it structured is so it is a benefit to businesses who come here and hire, okay, in our county. There is a lot of debate about that because the larger companies are passing those off out of state. and The benefits aren't really coming to the, the county or the state. So there's a lot of debate about that. But the larger issue is still significant, which is Clayton County residents have got to be able to move up in skill set, which means we need to make sure they're connected to programs. Myself, I came, I served years as a paralegal and did not have my degree. I'll speak for myself. I went as a non-traditional student to Clayton State, finished my bachelor's locally, and as soon as I did that, my income changed $20,000 a, a year, right? So those things are significant to partner with Clayton, to partner with the surrounding areas, and just to encourage our citizens, particularly our young folks, to get in there and achieve more and get those great jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Regina Deloach, I'm gonna give you the next question. And I'll just preview this question. It's really important to me. Um, as one of the efforts I worked for Georgia Women for a Change, which was a, a board that fought for issues in the county, I was on that board for three years, and we were able to successfully pass the first human trafficking law in the state. Um, and so this is a very important question to me. Um, how will you address the hotels and other areas where drug and sex trafficking are prominent? And how would you hold management and the other leaders accountable? Thank you so much. Two things, I started working with uh, extended states many, many years ago and engaging law enforcement and setting up stings to ensure, and we have shut down some restaurants that were partnering with hotels that were causing the sex trafficking of our uh, women. So that was achieved and accomplished. So we, sh we will notify law enforcement and work directly with law enforcement. And we did shut down a large restaurant because that is dear and near to my heart. So let's go to number two. We have to, if, if, when we're creating homes, we have many, many, many families that are in hotels. So we have to create a program that's called From Hotels to Homes. Mm -hmm. That is so important because when we include our <laughs> community and creating that livable, sustain, and we're talking sustainability, we're talking comprehensive, we have to create and training programs in which we've already have in place. Let's create that hotel to home program and partner in with HUD to ensure that our families are included and they have somewhere to stay. But we have to work hard with law enforcement. And that is the reason I spoke out against the gas station that is coming to fill the road in 42 that will have a playground. It makes no good business sense to have a gas station that is encompassed with a playground because you see a child parents pumping gas, that child boats out. We are close to 675, 285. That child is now gone, and how can we get back to that child? So we have to look at what we're doing as a community. When we're talking about building, what are we building, and how does that um, hurt our community, or how does it help? But no, law enforcement must be involved in this sex trafficking. And when we, we always say as adults, you see something, say something to our children. But what are we doing as adults? Do we right. see it, do we say anything? So we have to. Thank you. Next question will be for Hakim DeVoe. And this is going to be a question that we received from the audience as well. What partnership opportunities would you pursue with the Board of Education to promote workforce development? In particular, what policy decisions would you pursue to positively impact the community instead of work against them? I think we need to continue to realize the vision of the county. And I think the Board uh, of Education and the Board of Commissioners 
need to understand that our children are the future and they are our constituents and future constituents and they're coming from families that are our bosses. Again, I think when we begin to realize who we work for, we begin to look at problems differently. I think there needs to be a partnership with perhaps providing monies for getting homes or computers into homes and internet access. I think there should be monies and partnership uh, with the school system and the libraries. I mean, we have a gym in Clayton State University here in our county. Just like my experience with the Cab County, they have a program where they take the citizens and the children of that district, they work through a program uh, with the CTAE program where they have and take classes at high school and they gain experience and they can walk right into jobs with the local government. Uh, and then we have programs here as well. So I think we need to hone those skills. We don't want to throw the baby out with the bath water, but we want to build on what's working. So those programs are here in Clayton County too, but I think we need to put emphasis on it and put the money in behind our talk. So often we talk about our youth, but it's a side project to some of the things that we want to do. We need to realize that our youth are our future. And if we can have a program and enhance what we're already doing, giving our youth the skill set to walk right into, even if college still there are issues and they want to go there, or perhaps they can walk right into a job with our local government. Whether it's meter reading, administration, paralegal, whatever it is, I think we need to keep that in our forefront when we, we begin to develop policies. Thank you. Thank you. We have some really good questions coming from the audience. I'm going to give Junior this next question from the audience. First, do you believe the ethics board should remain under the board of commissions? If not, where and how would you accomplish this move? And what do you perceive the relationship between these appointed boards and the board of commissioners should be? As it relates to the ethics board, I, and it was through citizen engagement, citizen communication, that I realized that we can't expect corporations to police themselves, and we can't expect people in politics to police themselves. I think there needs to be an independent advisory or ethics commission that, again, can call for subpoenas, can you know, uh, you know, look for financial records and disclosures from people, on, commissioners on the board, so that way we can seek to make sure that they're not paying to play, or they're not double dipping, or there's not that conflict of interest. You know, one of the commissioners, one of the previous commissioners, was always being accused of that. You know, I, I, I don't want to, you know. <laughs> Nor any name dropping, but what I say, I believe that there needs to be an independent ethics commission that are made up of citizens who are engaged, who actually want to see and hold their politicians or their elected officials accountable. So, first and foremost, uh, a lot of the other boards, I'm on the, the Clayton County CSB board, the Clayton County CSB board. Some of the board, I think, the, the commission or the, the commissioners need to be a part of that. When you think about mental health, again, with us being that, you know, us focusing on mental health. We have the resources and the time to actually go out there and see what people are suffering from. So some of the actual boards, like economic development, I think definitely the commission needs to be a part of that because, again, they're the ones that are approving and voting on funds going out as it relates to development. But when you think about ethics, I think the commissioners should be completely separate of that. And again, if you're not doing anything, if you're being, if you're being, you know, if you're practicing integrity, there shouldn't be a problem. But obviously, they know there's a little bit of double dipping. There might be a little bit of conflict of interest there, and so they're afraid to release that power to an independent citizen advisor. I know that as your commissioner, everything that I'm going to do is for the greater good of the county, and I know that for a fact there will be no conflict because I want to make sure that you all are satisfied. You actually see the businesses and the spaces coming to your community that you think are going to benefit you and your family. So again, I am all for an independent ethics advisor. Thank you. Elena, we're going to get a question from the audience again. What are you, what are we doing about landowners and property managers purchasing land and not maintaining the property? And how can we solve this issue in the district? That's a great question. Y'all got great questions, all right? Like this is, this is a great group of folks out here, okay? Um, 
we need to make sure that we, the, the, the same way that for y'all who live in HOAs are required to cut your grass and keep your properties maintained, we all know that, that feeling, even if you live in an apartment complex that, you know, that is being managed, you know, there are certain expectations of how you keep your neighborhood clean. We need to have that same level of expectations and accountabilities for our commercial properties here in here in Clayton, throughout Clayton County, not just District 1, all of Clayton County. If we are bringing in businesses, we are asking them to be good stewards of the community. That means making sure their parking lots are maintained, making sure that they're cutting their grass and trimming, trimming their hedges, making sure that they're picking up the trash in their area. We want to be able to walk out of our front doors and see a Clayton County that is beautiful. Well, well, part of that is on the responsibility of the businesses that are here in Clayton County and making sure that we are, you know, at first, let's reach out to those businesses, send a letter. Hey, we need you to fix X, Y, Z. This is the deadline. And then we'll follow up with citations, then we'll follow up with, with fines. But first, we need to uh, make you know good will efforts and reach out to those commercial tenants and make sure that they are again being good community stewards. First that starts with a conversation, and then yes, that will start with some, some fining and we will put that money uh, back into beautifying Clayton County. Thank you. All right, you, are, you I agree, you guys are giving some wonderful questions, really thoughtfully. Um, put together questions. I'm going to give this next question to Shigel. It reads, how would you bridge the gap of diversity in our community and reach all residents? And she, and she continues to say that all candidates have great ideas. Would you be willing to work with the other candidates to move our district forward? That is a great question. Um, so first, let me say, working across um, the different diverse, it, it, first of all, Clayton County and District 1 in particular is extremely diverse. We have a nice, strong international population, not only just of Caucasian and African American, we have Asian, Indian, it's just a beautiful um, group of people, right? So for me, even though we're all different, we all want the same things. We want peace, we want a quiet neighborhood, we want somewhere clean to live. So it's all about finding those creative ways to connect our communities and to find the common ground, the things that we all want that are the same. I don't think it needs to be an afterthought. I think if you are gonna connect with communities, we probably should have already done it in this campaign here, right? Because it is about connecting with everybody right? Not just the larger groups. So you have to just be about the business of making it happen. That's one thing. Now, I think the second part of the question was about this group, this wonderful group. <laughs> um, this group of people that I had the honor of being, you know, a, a lot of people never have an opportunity to have their, their name placed on a ballot. So it's an honor to do it. But it's also an honor to serve with good people who I believe want the best for the county just like I do, right? And so um, for me, I welcome, I gotta say this, as your seated commissioners, working with all of these people here, just kidding. But yes, it, no matter how it goes, these are wonderful people who I believe um, want the county's best just like I do. So I'd be happy to work with them. Thank you. Regina DeLoach. And before I ask for this question, I'll let you know, we have about 10 minutes left uh, for questions, and then we're going to go into the closing statements for the candidates, okay? And we hope that you will stay and, and, and meet and greet the candidates after the forum today. Um, Regina, how would you improve transparency at the Clayton County Sheriff's Office? <laughs> you got it. You got it. I was going to say that's a good question. <laughs> but we have to have an oversight committee within the sheriff's office. We must have an oversight com a committee within our organization to man our um, our jail system. So I would say that we we have, need an oversight committee there. 
it's other departments that need oversight committees as well. Absolutely. So you just don't want to just uh, single out one component because if you, if, as I've been knocking on doors, you're going to get a very split balance sheet about that sheriff's office. Yes. So I will tell you, we need to form an oversight committee, not just for the sheriff's office, but just let's form an oversight committee for us as a community. Are we doing our due diligence to hold right. our county um, accountable for what's going on in our area? So let's be the oversight for ourselves when we start oversighting policing others. But yes, within our jail system, I will say that we do need an oversight committee so that we can honestly say what is going on so that we can maintain a favorable uh, community within our own county so that we can keep our residents safe and then being able to report back that we're doing the right thing within law enforcement within our county. Thank you. I can't say how amazing these questions are for the audience and thank you for this great contribution. The next question is going to be for Hackman DeVell. The Board of Election serves at the pleasure of the Board of Commission. Currently, there are no Republican representation on the Board of Elections. Throughout Clayton County, the majority is Democrat. However, how will you create opportunities to have minority voices heard and valued? Excellent question. Uh, one of the things that I've always found troubling when it comes to politics, people address you based upon what party you're affiliated with and they began to make assumptions from there. When I was out on the trail and just walking and talking with some of the citizens, I got a question, are you a Democrat or a Republican? And that disturbed me because based upon my answer was gonna be based upon how that person saw me. Will they hear me if I said I'm a Republican? Will they see me if I say I'm a Democrat? I think we need to, in many of these cases, when it comes to the greater good of the community, lose a lot of these adjectives after our names. So I think sometimes we need to develop a place at the table, whether it's through committee, whether it's through hearing, whether it's through whatever ethic boards that we can come up with, where our bosses, the citizens, put together a panel of people who they can elect and nominate to come sit in these boards and these hearings so we can hear the voices of all people. Again, I think it would be a tragedy if we only listen to Democratic voices, if you will, or Republican voices. I think that's why we have the issues we have with this nation. We're so divided and polarized based upon what our voting preference is. I think we need to lose all that and sometimes develop these nonpartisan boards so we can actually get things done. Because we all want the same thing, whether there's an R behind our name or a D behind our name. We're all humans and we want the basic things of life. Safety, a place to raise our children, a future, a neighborhood that we can live, work, and grow in. So again, just developing some place at the table, some committee to where our boss, the citizens, can appoint residents here, no matter their party affiliation, where they can be heard. If people are heard, we can communicate. And when we communicate, we can move mountains. Thank you. Thank you. Junior, I'm going to give you a question from the audience as well. Clayton County Schools are involved in two major real estate deals, one at South Lake Mall and the other at the flats at Mount Zion. What are the risks and rewards of such projects for the school system and the community in District 1 at large? There's always risk when you're developing and you're moving into such high traffic area. I think when you think about Mount Zion, just the congestion, you know, we see in certain parts of Atlanta, if you have a house on, on let's say, West Face Ferry, I'm, I'm giving you an example that's far out, but can you imagine not being able to get out of your house or your apartment or, you know, able to leave work and get home, especially if you live within the county? So when you're, when you're beginning to build and develop in those areas, you run the risk of traffic, and remember, there are a lot of apartments and residential spaces out there where kids are potentially going to be at risk for uh, having to cross major four-lane highways, so that's always a risk. When you factor in that, instead of, depending on what you're building, you're taking away those spaces for young people to actually, maybe their parents to uh, enter into home ownership, 
or for them to get the spaces for them to entertain and relax recreational spaces as well. I think there's always risk, but we want to see the, the school system grow, and we, and we definitely know that whatever they're building there, it's going to be for the benefit of the students there. So, you know, I think with close monitoring, we need to see what they're developing, what's going to be built there, and then I can make a better assessment of whether it's really worth it, or if maybe that maybe that space should maybe be used for entertainment or housing versus the school system. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Elena, what will you what will you do to help residents in Fort Gillum hold the Army Corps of Engineers responsible for ongoing contamination that impacts the surrounding area of that base? That's another audience question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It sure is. Let's talk about the environment, y'all. Uh, I know the Sunrise Movement is doing you know great work in, in as, as far as bringing awareness to making sure that we are considering environmental impacts and what that looks like for Clayton County residents. We have a gym in Fort Gillum. That's incredible. Yes, they are bracking that facility, and it's going to be you know within the city of Forest Park. But uh, that is an opportunity to bring in, you know, those those companies that are coming in, like Kroger, like Amazon, who are using that as a logistics hub. Yes, that is bringing money into the community. But we need to also make sure that we are uh, we are maintaining the health and well-being of the community and making sure uh, that we are providing that we are reviewing and uh, overseeing, I'm trying to use the word oversight now, uh, of, of what's going on as they, um, as they move from a military base into a more commercial and uh, city county owned uh, base, making sure that uh, there isn't any underground contamination that is affecting the water. Uh, there is an apartment complex that is located just under, just south of Fort Gill, and making sure that the residents who have been living there, making sure uh, that they are are healthy, and for any individuals who stayed in those properties, uh, that there was no contamination uh, as that base has been being wrecked. So we need to make sure that there is oversight, that we are reviewing what's happening, and then uh, holding this process. Uh, holding it accountable. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to keep going. I'm going to combine this question um, with with a question we had before, um, and for Shigel. Shigel, as you know, the northern section of District One is zoned heavily industrial. So, how are you, as an elected official, going to? Um, coordinate efforts to address and discourage the gases and carbon monoxide that are constantly being produced by the vehicles that are coming in the district due to the zoning. Okay, so the first part of the question was... We are zoned heavily in dis uh, industrial right. in District 1. Mm -hmm. Knowing that... That's a okay. fact. What will you do, what efforts will you do to address the gaseous and carbon monoxide that are produced by the constant, that are being constantly produced by the vehicles in the district due to the zoning. Okay, I want because I want to make sure that I answer the question. Um, so the question is about the fuel and what is emitted from the trucks as they come. And the residents, I can tell you, absolutely hate this, right? Because what happens is, as they're coming from work or just their daily business, they may be stuck behind a truck at an exit for 15 or 20 minutes, y'all. It's excessive, right? So I think, and this is the thing that I want to make clear about this particular part of District 1, for all of the warehouses that you have that are already built, there are still warehouses in the pipeline to be built, and there is still undeveloped industrial zone land there. So the approach has to be aggressive. And I committed to those residents there, and I'll say it today, that I will work for to stop whatever can be stopped, not only now, but in the future, in terms of industri industrial over there. So again, you have to be able to look at moving the trucks off of the community spaces and exits and ramps and things that we use, doing that through access roads, giving them um, smaller, I'll give you an example, 
off of Forest Parkway. There's an access road off of uh, 75 that runs all the way up the side of 75 to keep the trucks out of the residential neighborhoods. So we have to be aggressive about connecting with the Department of Transportation, Jeff Matarco and the county, and we have to sit down and address it immediately for the safety of the residents, for the quality of life of the residents, and you also have to begin, um, she mentioned LEADS certification, moving our um, qualifications higher so that the businesses are responsible for the emissions that they transmit and moving towards something more sustainable. Hope that answers the question. Thank yes, you. thank you. Regina, I'm gonna give you the next question. I'm gonna go back to the beginning of where we started today. And the question is, when obstacles arise and disagreements occur within the board, what plan of action are you gonna to take to make sure District 1 thrives through roadblocks and disagreements? And the disagreements in your reference to with my colleagues as yes. commissioners. We have to know why we have been elected to be there. That's number one. We all, and for me, is to have a conversation with my colleagues as your District 1 commissioner, is to talk with them, to, to share with them what is in your why. Why were you elected? And their why should be the same as my why, is to ensure that the people within District 1, 2, 3, 4 are taken care of. So when it comes to disagreement, we have to remove self and replace it with the people in order for us to move forward because disagreements, we have to look at it and say, what is for the good of the entire group? What is this good for the county? And that's what we have to look at when it comes to disagreements. So we have to remove self and replace it with the people. And that's the reason we were there and elected to serve was on the behalf of the people. So disagreements, you have to fit your level of maturity and know why you're there. Thank you. Have fun to know. I'm going to um, continue where, where we are. Oh no, actually, sorry, I have another question for the audience, I forgot. All right, uh, we recently met with Jeff Turney about the revenue from the uh, airport. Nothing was accomplished. Most of the airport sits in Clinton County, but revenue goes to Atlanta. What are we going, what are you going to do um, to address this issue? That's a great question. Uh, I understand that the cities at one point fought and sued, but the circuit, uh, 11th Circuit District uh, judge didn't really rule one way or another, which left us still in a standstill state. I think we should continue that fight. I think for as long as we are in this county, we should continue that fight. I don't think we should give up. I think we should continue to press. As they say, that squeaky wheel gets the oil. Most of the times I've seen in politics, if you go away with the first no, they'll keep doing what they're doing. But you let them know we're not going anywhere. The airport isn't going anywhere. I don't plan on going anywhere. My neighbors doesn't plan on going anywhere. So I say we should continue to press the issue. We shouldn't go quietly into the night. I think it is just a travesty that 80% of Hartfield Jackson sits in our county, but somebody else is reaping the benefit. Our police department's got to respond to a lot of those calls. All of the air pollution, all of the high traffic that's coming in here. And we all mentioned it as well. You know, this is sex trafficking capital here. You know, so all of the hard backbreaking labor is falling on Clayton County, but the reason that the benefits and the money is going to the city of Atlanta. I say we continue to press and we don't take no for an answer. So I would say we get with the commissioner, we get with the mayors, we get with the communities, and we get with the people, and we continue to press this thing. Because I say again, if you go away quietly in the night, they'll continue business as usual. But right now, Clayton County matters. It matters today, it matters yesterday, and they'll continue to matter in the future. We need to continue that fight and take no for an answer. Great. We're another runway right now. I'm gonna give Junior and Elena, one more question, and we're going to go into the closing statements. Junior, what will you do to ensure that big business and corporations are properly investing in the upkeep of the community and the school system? So, great question. My idea, again, with big corporations, 
they have the fund, they realize that there's money to be made here, there's possibly the working force here, we're going to have them possibly when they're doing those applications for development, also show how you're going to train your employees, how you're going to make sure that once you build your space or you bring your business here, how can you ensure that the citizens here actually get those jobs and you're not just pulling people from Cobb, Gwinnett, Fulton. We want people here. So again, yes, we are lacking as it relates to some of the technical skills. Again, with the school system, you see that we have the CTAE program. I was a marketing teacher for six years. Again, they have pathways where these students, again, healthcare, marketing, aviation, they take three courses and they are now certified, which means that without going to college, they are certified in these industries. Again, the school system has already done their part, done their part as it relates to the pathways, but we need to see the corporations begin to invest. Again, if a, if a person is, uh, let's say they're, they're certified in uh, computer science, again, so they, they already have the base of it and the surface knowledge from the school system to actually lock to that job and potentially get it. But once they get it, we want to see the corporation actually give them the tools specific to their business, specific to their industry, specific to the job. So again, the school system with the CTAE career pathway, they're doing their job. Again, I've seen my students graduate with degrees or with certifications in marketing management, entrepreneurship, aviation, healthcare. And again, but with the corporation on their end, as they're coming here wanting to build either using current spaces that are are here or building new spaces, we want to see them put some kind of training training process in place where they're training citizens, specific to our citizens, specific to our citizens, not just people in general, to our citizens to ensure that they're the ones filling these jobs, they're the ones filling these vacancies. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Elena. We have one more audience question that we did not address, so I'm gonna make sure that we get that done with this um, question for Elena. What is your stance on mandatory trash pickup? <laughs> <laughs> will your decision be based on the county holistically, or will it be based on just District 1 only? Thank you. <laughs> I feel like I got all the trash questions, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all are going to be like, okay, I'm ready. let's talk about trash. That's fine. Yes, let's talk about trash. Let's talk about beautification. Okay. I have heard from so many residents, and I, I've, I've heard from, from both sides. Some people say, I want to you know, be able to continue paying for my individual household to have trash collected. I have heard from others who say that they would rather uh, fold into the county trash collection and pay uh, and, and pay that flat rate. Uh, this is going to be a decision that is based on uh, the majority of what District 1 wants. But let's be honest, most of Clayton County is unincorporated. So uh, for those individuals who don't live uh, within Morrow, Forest Park, Lake City. If you live outside of city jurisdiction, then yes, you're an unincorporated Clayton County and that decision about how your trash is gonna be picked up is made by the Board of Commissioners. But there is no decision that I would ever vote on as your next commissioner without your input and without hearing from the entire district to see what the majority of residents want and to also determine what is in the best course of action to make sure that trash is uh, picked up efficiently, effectively, regularly and on time. We so, don't want mandatory trash pickers. Thank you. All right. <gasps> Community forums, just like this, where we're listening and hearing what do people want, what do people not want, and making sure that uh, it is the voices of District 1 that determines what that the final decision for trash collection pickup looks like. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for your wonderful questions. They were very, very, very um, we're going to wrap up our forum with some closing statements from each of the candidates. You're going to have one minute to tell the voters of District 1 why they should vote for you. Um, and then after that, I'm going to bring up um, more gusto to um, open us up for the, um, the meet and greet. Okay, so everybody has one minute. You're going to look um, at a time for your timekeeper. And we're going to start with Chanel. Why should you vote for me? First of all, quickly, thank you everyone, the organizers, the church, everyone, the citizens for coming out today. Why should you vote for me? Because what you see is what you get. 
I'm honest, I'm hardworking, um, I'm willing to aggressively sit at the table and fight for what District 1 needs. My objective is to hear your concerns, listen to what my district needs, and to bring it back home for District 1. That means I must be conciliatory to our other, my other commissioners. I must be a listener and I must be a doer. You have my number, 404-751-6726. That is always available and accessible. I will always respond to you. Thank you in advance and I request, respectfully ask for your vote today if you go to the poll, Shaquille Crew Thurman. Thank you. Would you make a vote? Again, thank you so much for coming out. What sets me apart from my colleagues is that I didn't start doing this work yesterday. I've been in the trenches doing this work for a long time for District 1 and for this county. And we have been successful on whatever we have touched. If it's been partnering with the school, is it from development? If it's standing up against gas stations that we deem not fit to come into our community? I didn't start this yesterday. I have been in the trenches for District 1 for a long time, speaking out for the good of District 1. So I am willing to continue to work for District 1, not when it's favorable, when it's unfavorable. I am your candidate, because I have been accessible. I've been here 30 years. I've been in my home for 27 years. So again, I'm Regina Deloach. I am your commissioner. I am your servant to work on behalf of District 1 and this county. So I do look forward to serving you as your next commissioner because I'm accessible, I've been in the trenches, and I will continue to move our county and our community forward. Kathleen DeVoe. I humbly ask for your vote. As your next commissioner, I will not disappear and fade into the background, only to be seen during the next election season. That sort of politics is tired, is time out. I'm not a politician, I'm a public servant. I will always put people above politics and the policies that I enact will be people oriented. I understand that I'm not the boss. You are the boss of me. I get that. I am of you as well. I come from the community and I wanna see us thrive. As a public servant, I understand the value of raising a family in the county, and I won't run. I mentioned earlier that I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, and what I've known is in good leadership, there's transparency, honesty, and dialogue. That is what I bring to the table. 21 years of government experience, and I'm a veteran as well. I understand what it means to serve. Thank you. Junior J.J. Jackson. Thank you, thank you, J.J. everybody. Well, thank you so much for you know attending. Thank you so much for the organizers for setting up this forum. I've enjoyed the questions. But again, I'm running because since 17, you know, I started my family very early. But again, I went to college. I've obtained my master's degree. I've taught. I've volunteered. I've worked in so many areas of nonprofit. I think my commitment to this county, buying my second home here, at the age of 30, buying my first home at the age of 22. I'm committed, I have the know, I have the, with the wherewithal, I have the intelligence, I have the integrity, and I recognize that through real leadership is real service. It's all about serving the people and making sure that they are a part of the decision-making process. I know that people are tired of being told what to do, how to do it, versus us communicating, sharing in that responsibility, and making sure that we all have a input and have say in what we see happening in our community. My family were young, and again, I'm not just doing it for my family, I'm doing it for those those seasoned saints, is what we call them, you know. As you get older, and as you're moving into that next phase of life, I wanna make sure that you're not only comfortable, but you feel safe, that you can, you can call me and reach out to me anytime. So, Junior Jackson, JJ Jackson, thank you. <laughs> Helena Reeves. Hey y'all, I wanna thank everyone who is here in the building today. I wanna thank the organizers and the church for hosting us, everyone who is tuned in uh, virtually on, on Facebook. My name is Elena Reese and I'm homegrown. I am of Clayton County. I am a community organizer who has been on the ground and I am so uh, 
honored and humbled to have the support of Georgia leaders like Stacey Abrams, like Ambassador Andrew Young, because their endorsement is a testament to the work that I have been doing across the state of Georgia. I serve on the Democratic National Committee. That means Clayton County has a voice at a national table to, de to, de to make decisions on, on what is happening throughout Georgia. Early voting is this weekend. We have Saturday and Sunday voting, so I'm asking you now to go vote uh, to find those early voting locations, please go to my website, elenaforclayton.com. And yes, I am last. I'm always last to speak. That means I'm also last on the ballot. So you got to read down the ballot for reads. Thank you all so much for being out here today. I appreciate your support and I hope to earn your vote. My name is Elena Reeves. Thanks, y'all. Love everybody. Love the One second, sir. One second. one second, sir. Is all one here? second. No, one second, please. Oh, oh, one second. I want to first say thank you for everybody for being here, and I'm really, I'm humbled and excited that you're able to uh, address the audience and the, the citizens. We're going to move ourselves into the next phase of our program, and I'm going to bring up Marika Stowe from the Villages of Inglewood Coalition, who I'm very proud to partner with. Um, to do our next question. But thank you so much for having me today. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mari Gusta, and I am working with the Villages of Ellenwood Coalition. And so I just wanted to, first off, thank each and every one of you all who are here this morning as candidates for a commission, uh, for a District 1 commissioner, because it is an important role, and we definitely have a lot of work to do in this district. So I definitely appreciate you humbly putting yourself on the line, but also taking on this challenge. Also, I wanna thank everybody here as well who has taken out their time to come here this morning to show their support for District 1. We are stronger together than we work together. So it's definitely appreciative that you're here as well. I just wanna let everyone know that your voice is important and we need to hear your voices and the only way we can do that is by going to the polls. And so today, you have an opportunity to go to the polls from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Along with Sunday, you have from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. And then on this upcoming week, Monday through Friday, you have an opportunity to go from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. as well. We have over 7,000 registered voters within District 1. However, currently from what the Elections and Registration Department has reported so far as of September 9th, we only have a little bit over 600 voters who have voted. So I ask that you go out and vote. You get your family members, everyone in your household, in your community, in your neighborhoods, at the grocery stores, at the gas stations to come out and vote. We need to hear you. It's good to express ourselves on next door and different apps and applications. But unless you go put that ballot in the box, your voice isn't heard. And so this is an opportunity for you to be heard and actually be seen. And so I definitely want to you know, encourage everyone to come out. And not only that, we do have some upcoming things that's coming about as well. We have a youth commission forum that's going to be with the school board, District 8, which lies within District 1. Um, so we just want to make sure that you're coming out. We have those individuals, candidates here as well. If you can, please stand up so that way they can see you as well. Thank you so much. And so you have two opportunities this upcoming week to talk with them as well. We have on Monday the Villages of Ellenwood Coalition who is going to be doing a Zoom call with those two individuals and that link is posted in next door and it will be posted in several other locations as well for you to be able to talk with them because our schools affects us even though you may not have children our schools affects us not only with our property taxes but also with our economic growth and anything else that comes to Clayton County is based on schools so definitely make sure that you encourage people to come to that forum along with the youth commission I was really, really happy to see what they did with the District 1 Commission that they had. And so our youth are active, and we want to encourage them and back them up as much as possible. So they're going to be at our previous um, location that we just had with the District 1, which is going to be at Commissioner Sonia Singleton's um, Senior Citizen Center that's on Amdale Block. So I just want to make sure that you all know 
to get out there, bring as many people as possible to the polls so that way they can vote and make sure your voices are heard. And I would like to uh, now turn it over to organize Clayton for some giveaways. And we are going to still hear from you as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I am not going to repeat what everyone else said. Just thank you so much for being here. The one thing I do have to say, you must be present to get this gift. <laughs> so, these are our gifts, two $25 gift cards. And, I'm here. Oh, <laughs> and I'm making a mess, but I have a couple of, that I have a Dorola Cherifant, Cherifant? She not? Okay, well she can't win. <laughs> she got it. And I have, um, Joyce Howard. Oh. Oh, my God. oh, that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> and we have, uh, I have Cedric Walker. Yeah. 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 Let me get you. Okay, I'm sorry we couldn't get you guys online because I don't know how you would get to me because I don't know how to get around to <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm glad we do that. And but definitely, we just wish that all of the candidates could have been here because you guys are awesome. Yeah. You had some of the best questions yeah. ever. Yeah. We glad to send you up to I tell you, check them out. They're, they're ready. Okay, I don't know who I'm supposed to give this to. <laughs> I appreciate the candidates. Oh, oh, Mr. Garber. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, no, no. Yes, do you need a mic, sir? No, no ma'am. I'm going to speak loud now. Oh, we're going to let you speak, and then Maury has another announcement. We can do the meeting. You're going to let me speak now? Yes, sir. One minute. Let, One minute. Okay. <laughs> let me say this that there are 10 people running for the office of commissioner in our first district. And these people here are the only ones that have shown up to all three meetings. Your, your, decision, your decision making has been cut in half. There you go. Thank you. and um, for a person that's here in the audience. And we just wanted to make sure everybody was aware. Um, our vote is serious, but also the attack on our vote is also just as serious. And to let you all know, we do have over 200,000 people that they have purged from the voting roll within the state of Georgia. And also, we need a lot of people to help the poll as being workers at the polls because you know, it's always in the news on CNN and different places where poll workers are being chased, being attacked verbally, physically. And so we need as many people as possible to help to support, to keep that sacred ballot and keep that sacred location so that way we all have our voices heard. So I just wanted to make sure you are aware. Super voters are getting purged as well, so just make sure you're checking your voting status making sure that you are able to vote, and if not, making sure that you're reaching out to those people to get that taken care of. So thank you again. Thank you everyone for coming out. Now we will do the meet and greet so you can you know, talk with the candidates. And if you signed up, uh, we will send all of the candidates' information directly to you as well as the information about um, the upcoming candidate forms for the Board of, board of District. No, no, no. Last going for the school board, thank you. <laughs> thank you again, everyone. That
you know, outside after the picture.